There was a long second where the five thugs stared at the knife on the floor at Amos' feet, and he stared back at them. The emptiness in his belly was gone. The hollow space behind his sternum, gone. His throat had stopped hurting. Who's next, he said, flexing his hands. His face in a grin he didn't know he had. They came in a rush. Amos spread his arms and welcomed them like long-lost lovers. And welcome them he did. And man, everything looks great in this season so far. And holy mackerel, things are about to be a lot different for the inner planets. Kind of makes me want to grab a bottle of Firehawk whiskey and go drown my sorrows over by the Augustine Gamora Memorial. Hey guys, Pete here. Gonna break down the first three episodes of The Expanse Season 5, which just dropped on Amazon Prime Video. Exodus, The Churn, and Mother did a pretty good job of setting the table across a lot of different individual storylines. The crew's broken up, everyone had to get to where they're going, but things look as though they're really gonna pick up from here. This video will include spoilers from everything that's happened in The Expanse TV show up until this point, so that's your warning. And as someone who's read all the books, I'm going to refer to them, but won't be giving away any future spoilers. There's a lot to cover since we got three episodes, so let's get right into it. Episode 1 opens following Rock Number 9, which is an iron nickel core, and this is 173 days after it was launched towards Earth. Apparently, it got too close to the sun and broke up. The science vessel, the UNS Hasami, picked up the debris near Venus. But before they can figure out what they're looking at, they get boarded by Philip Naros and his Free Navy crew. After making sure the Hassani crew doesn't know anything about the rocks, he kills them and takes the ship's data cores. We see that Naomi's son is ruthless and dedicated to this cause, and he even has to leave one of his crew behind as the ship's destroyed. Over at Tycho, we learn that the Rosinante is in for repairs, they're extended it's going to take time. We're introduced to a couple new characters here. We meet Sakai, who's working on the ship, and we meet Bull, who is now working for Fred Johnson. And this is a repurposing of a character that played a large role in the third book. His story was mostly absorbed into the character we now know as Drummer. And what's funny here is that he's playing the role that her character actually played when she was first introduced in the books. We follow Naomi and we see her find out where her son is through Fred Johnson and learn that Amos and Alex have already left. Naomi buys the ship Chesmoka with the intention of going and finding Philip. From Holden's perspective, we see that colonization is in full swing. Colony ships are going through the ring gates. People are trying to stake their claim in these new systems. He runs into Monica Stewart. She's asking questions about the protomolecule. He reassures her that all the active samples have been destroyed. But then she sort of baits him, telling him that she knows something about tests that are going on. That gets him to go to Fred and ask him about his protomolecule sample. He tells him it's secure but not to ask where it is. Then he shows him that LV Okoye is still on Illus doing tests on the bullet, the weapon that destroyed the ring builder's civilization. Fred asks him if whoever did that is a threat to humans. Holden says that every time he passes through a ring, it's like he passes through their world. He sees them. And each time he sees them, he thinks they look angrier. He thinks that going through the rings is waking them up. And he thinks that whatever happened with him and Miller, it's changed his brain so that he can see them. Fred isn't convinced at all. No more of these artifacts have shown up on the other worlds they've visited. Nobody's been killed by a bullet yet. And until they can finish the Navy they're building so that the OPA can police the rings and the belt without any interference from the inner planets, he's not willing to give up his protomolecule sample. Naomi tells Holden that she's leaving and that she doesn't want him to come along. And we see her depart Tycho for a palace station and can see that Holden isn't taking it well. Elsewhere, we catch up with Amos as he's traveling back to Earth. I opened the video with an excerpt of the chapter where he gets into this fight on the transport ship. Because if you haven't read the books, you are actually missing a layer here. Because this was the first time we got point of view Amos chapters where we hear what he's thinking. In the show's version of events, he just comes off as a badass who doesn't want to pay these thugs who are shaking everybody down for insurance. It still makes for a great scene, but in the book we had the setup that he was feeling physically sick, but at the same time knew that he couldn't be coming down with something because he had already taken all the boosters and medications that you do. And he hears Lydia's voice in his head telling him, you're not getting sick, you feel sad. 
So that whole line about him provoking these guys to get into the fight and then opening his arms and welcoming them like long lost lovers. This is all sort of his way of working his way through it. But he does make it to Luna. We see him carrying the bag that had Mertry's name on it with his name written over top, which is awesome. We get this amazing introductory sequence where we see the moon in all its glory. We catch a glimpse of the Augustin Gamara Memorial, which is a really interesting Easter egg because this is the ship that Marco Inaros tricked Naomi into writing the code that caused it to blow up in dock on the moon. So that's a memorial to the worst thing that Naomi ever did. And a lot of people were killed in that. Amos is met by security and he's taken to see Avasarala, who wants to know why he's going to Earth. She wants to know if it has something to do with Holden. He tells her the truth that he's going there because this woman Lydia, who took care of him when he was young, after his mother died, herself has passed away and he's going there to tie up the loose ends of that. They have a great exchange where he calls her Chrissy and she tells him that she's a member of Parliament, not his favorite stripper, and he responds that she could be both. We see that Ava Sarala is having trouble transitioning from being in charge of everything all the time. We meet this new character, Delgado, who's working with her. They talk about the Hasami, which we saw Philip take out in the beginning. She has suspicions about that, and we see her watching a feed where she's looking into Marco. Alex makes it to Mars. Apparently, he's bringing the razor back there for Bobby. Ava Sarala gave that to her. It's kind of funny when he's being cleared to land. The guy on the radio tells him that if he would have brought the Tachi, they probably wouldn't let him do that. Of course, that's the original name of the Rosinante before they salvaged it. He has a plan to go see his ex-wife. She doesn't want to see him. That goes about as good as you think something like that might. Then he goes to meet with Bobby, where she acts really weird, tells him that things aren't going her way, and basically shits on him for his idea of going to see his wife and his kid. We saw that she's been working on behalf of Abbasarala, looking into all these black market weapons deals where people are selling off Martian firepower to the belt. And when Alex walks away, we see him looking around and you can see that Mars is dying. A lot of the places are closed down, things are emptying out, and it's a pretty tough situation there since the ring gates open. Open. We even saw Asai's family from last season messaging Bobby thanking her for helping them get out there through the ring gates. At the end of episode one, we get a preview of where those rocks that Marco threw at the end of season four are at. Of course, we saw number nine break up, so we can imagine there's at least nine, if not more. There's eight that are lined up with Earth in the season four finale, but in this shot, we see several of them along with their projected impact time. We see that they're pointed at different locations, and we see one that says 12 days, seven hours, one that says 14 days, four hours, 14 days, 20 22 hours, 15 days, 3 hours, and the last one I could make out said 24 days, 4 hours. So we know that they're coming and we know that their impact is spaced out. Episode 2 opens up with one of those colony ships being taken by pirates. We see Kamina Drummer and her ships show up to levy a 10% tax on the pirates for operating in their area. So my takeaway from this is that Drummer is now a pirate. She's the captain of the ship, the DeWalt. They have another one called the Motang. And her crew is made up of her family because she's in a plural marriage with all these people. So we get a brief introduction to what their life looks like. Interestingly, one of her partners is named Michio Pa, which is another character that they sort of absorbed into Drummer when they first introduced her. So this is a character that book readers will be paying attention to. In this scene, we also find out that they located the Tynan, and that is Ashford's ship, so they'll go looking for that. Following Amos, we get another amazing introductory shot of Baltimore this time. We get a brief introduction to what Earth looks like. He goes to Lydia's place and he meets Charles, who's a man who's been with Lydia for the last 10 years. They live together. Initially, he's suspicious of him because the thing is, Amos came to Earth because he wanted to find out how Lydia died. And if he found out something happened to her, he was going to kill everyone involved. This was his explicit plan. As they're talking, we see this shift in Amos at the moment that he realizes Charles was good to her, that he did care for her, and that she died of natural causes an aneurysm, and nothing funny happened. He finds out that Charles is losing the house because this guy Eric, who was taking care of her, was no longer going to keep it after she passed away. Amos tells him to stop packing, and then he goes to look for Eric. 
And we get another badass scene where he makes himself known to a street dealer, telling him if he wants to be his friend, that he'll get word to Eric for him. That works out. He meets Eric at his office. And in the show's version of events, we get an idea that they have a history, that Amos made the choice to kill their boss rather than kill him. And then he helped Amos take their boss's identity and get off the planet. And that's why when Monica was asking him questions about his past, she brought up the name Amos Burton in relation to a mob boss in Baltimore. We learn that Amos's real name is Timothy, and we see that Eric is afraid of him. But once he realizes that all he really wants is for him to take care of the old man, he agrees to do that, but tells Amos that even though he loves him, even though he misses him, if he comes back to his city, he'll take him out. We had been seeing Amos having these visions of his younger self and Lydia around the city. We see one more flashback where he's talking to her, and we see they have a strong bond that she agrees to take care of him. It's less than what we learn about him in the books, and I don't want to spoil that because we still might get to that over the next couple of episodes. But generally speaking, he seems to have done what he came there to do. He's ready to leave Earth for good, but he contacts Abasarala and tells her there's one person he does want to see and he needs her help to get that set up. On Tycho, the Rossi repairs are ongoing. Holden is there missing his crew. He gets a message from Monica. That sucks him in because she feels like she can prove to him that somebody's going after the protomolecule. When he goes to look for her, he finds out that she's been kidnapped. She was in a shipping container, and after busting into the wrong one, they find her in the nick of time. They save her life. On Mars, Bobby and Alex get back together. She explains what she's been doing, shows him all the weapons she's bought, and she tells him about this guy, Sovateri. Alex knows the name, he thinks he can get the guy to talk to him, and he goes to see him talk at the War College. We see this guy is high-ranking, he's well-spoken, he definitely has an interest in the rings and how they change things, but when he approaches him, he won't give Alex the time of day. Instead, Emily Babbage comes up to him, says that she'd love to talk, and then later we see that she's doing that for Sovateri to figure out what Alex is doing on the planet. On Luna, Avasarala is trying to warn Nancy Gao and the other members of the UN that something's going on. Nobody wants to listen to her. Delgado is still working with her, and they're still looking into Marco. In episode 3, they meet with an outside scientist to ask questions about the Hasami. The information they get there, combined with what she's hearing from Bobby on Mars, convinces her that there's something going on. We see Drummer and her crew find Ashford's ship. She finds the message that he left as he was being spaced by Marco, and that convinces her to go after him for the bounty. Not everyone in her crew thinks it's a good idea, and we see a lot of great drummer in this episode. We get to see the other side of her. We see how she's dealing with losing Ashford. We see one of her partners, Oksana, try to talk her out of going after Marco, saying that she's doing it for revenge. Drummer tries to say that she's just doing it for the money. And they have a moment together that ultimately convinces Drummer to take the information she has from Ashford and send it to Fred Johnson. After saving her, Monica shows Fred and Holden footage she has of Cortazar being abducted. He's one of the researchers that had the procedure done so that he is a sociopath, basically, and he has extensive experience working with the protomolecule. He was last seen, he was abducted by Anderson Dawes. This video of him being abducted is from Ceres, and her source tells her it's from a research facility. This whole situation convinces Fred that there's something going on, that there's moles in Tycho Station that have allegiances to more radical factions of the OPA. In their investigation to find out who kidnapped Monica, they find two dead bodies and then also realize that there's a ship coming to pick up the container she was in. They're under the assumption that they haven't realized that she's been rescued yet, so they're going to wait till this ship comes in to get to the bottom of what's going on. On Mars, Alex meets up with Emily, who's effectively just shaking him down for information. She's asking a lot of questions about the protomolecule, what happened when they got to Illus, how they activated the structures that were on the surface that were left behind. When they're leaving, he finds out that the next day she's shipping out on the Bar Keith. When he gets back to his room, he's attacked. He's drugged with a sedative that's basically like a truth serum, so he gives up all the information he has. He tells his attackers that he's wondering if Sovater is selling weapons and that he's involved with Bobby Draper, but then she shows up just in time to save him because they were going to execute him after they got the information. After that's all said and done, they make a plan to follow the Bar Keith and the Razorback. 
Naomi arrives at Palace Station. She reunites with old friends, Sin and Carl. We had already seen them working with Philip earlier, and she tells them that she wants to see him. They end up meeting, and she makes a plea that she wants to help him, she wants to get him out, she give him the Chet's Mocha so that he can get away from his father and do whatever he wants. He basically tells her to fuck off, that she doesn't know what he needs, and that she knows nothing about him. Later, when she's on the ship, he returns, and she thinks that he changed his mind, but instead he's there to take the ship. They take her prisoner, basically, and she finds herself in a rough position. So at this point, Avasarala probably has the best idea of what's going on, but as mentioned, no one's going to listen to her. We see her reach out to Arjun, and we saw her with her daughter earlier to kind of underline the idea that her relationship with him is suffering because she won't put this job behind her. She tells him that she's still needed there, and then she receives the message from Fred that has the information from Ashford that he got sent from Drummer. So all the pieces are starting to come together, and then that's where things change. We see this guy with his Fish Finder 3000 glasses on, looking at the ocean, standing on the beach, and we see the first rock enter the atmosphere and crash to the earth. We see his face almost get instant sunburn, and we see the reflection of the impact in his lenses. And at ground zero, we see that he's just blown away. And I don't think I really need to tell anyone, but it's fairly obvious that this is going to be a big issue for Earth. The impact appears to be off the coast of Africa. The sign we see here is in Zulu, according to Translate. And from the end of episode one, we know there are several other of these following with the next one coming at the latest in two days, based off the ones that I could make out. So Marco and the Free Navy were able to pull off their attack. They stole the stealth technology, they put it on the asteroid, it made it past Earth's defenses. And now we have to wait for a week to find out what exactly that means. The loss of life will be devastating, but it's also the Belters crossing a line that many would consider unthinkable. Earth is where human life developed. It wasn't just the first planet, but it was the only planet with a breathable atmosphere before the ring gates open. As mentioned, it's an attack that crosses a line, and it ensures that things will never be the same. So there's a lot to take in here. Overall, I think they did a great job of having so many different stories, so many different balls in the air. They didn't really drop any. The character work was all pretty effective. As a book reader, it's a little bit hard to say. I was a little underwhelmed with the Amos stuff compared to how I imagined it, having read the books and knowing what was going on in his internal dialogue. The novella about him, The Churn, sets up the Eric character, so I was expecting some more detailed flashbacks to that, similar to how we saw other novellas featured in earlier seasons. But having said that, I think the way that they played it out, it still is rather effective. And he's still on Earth at this point, so there's more to come. He's our guy on the ground. The first rocks hit, and he's going to be there to experience that firsthand. I was really curious to see where they were going to go with Drummer, and this is pretty interesting. Without giving book spoilers, there's a lot of stuff here that calls back to characters, and I was a little bit concerned about some of the stuff that Michio Pa did in the book, and how that really wouldn't make sense for Drummer, so we'll see how that plays out. The Belter scenes all landed. We got a good introduction to Philip and his world. Seeing Naomi arrive and go through all of that hit, and we can imagine that she's due for a reunion with Marco as well. Seeing Drummer with her family, her polyamorous union, it does add to an already compelling character. On some levels, the way the Belters live is always kind of the most interesting just because they live in space. But across the spectrum and all the different locations, we got to see more of the way that people live, it seemed like, in these three episodes. And it feels like a good way to ground everything because we're going to be able to see people experience this attack across all these different locations to amplify just how far-reaching the effects are. Everything looked fantastic. I think these are three of the best-looking episodes they've ever put out. Tycho and Mars both look great, and especially Earth and Luna. The only thing I would complain about is that as a recapper, three episodes is a whole lot of stuff. There's so many references and so many things I'd like to dive into, but I think it's going to take some bonus videos because there's so much to cover in just the recap itself. I enjoyed these episodes. I think it was a great start. Really curious to see how the Mars story develops. Sovater is a character that we know of, but he may be also absorbing some extra roles here. Also, it was really interesting to see Cortazar show up, so I'm interested to see where they're going to take that, especially considering that Elvi is still involved in the story and she 
she's out there studying the bullet. And with that, I think I'll leave it there. Let me know any questions you have about all three episodes in the comments. I'll try to answer whatever I can. Let me know what you liked the most, what you think was the most interesting. What do you want to see in the rest of the season? Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'll be doing plenty of Expanse content throughout this season, all the way until the show wraps up in season six. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.